I'm opening. We have an eye, part of a nostril, two teeth. Hmm. One of the teeth has a small cavity. Close call, folks, but I think we got here just in time. Presented by Maria Menounos and Kevin Undergaro. This is Anatomy of a Movie. In-depth discussions and breakdowns of various movie titles. And now that you've seen the movie, let the dissection begin. Welcome, everybody, to Anatomy of a Movie. Today we are talking about DreamWorks animated film, How to Turn Your Dragon 2. Yeah! Yes! I'm your host, Marissa Serafini, and with me I have... Hi guys, it's Sarah Stratton. Hey movie fans, Dimitri Panos. Dimitri, B. Dimitri's I'm back. back. <laughs> He's back. Hello everyone, thank you for listening. Okay, what did we think of the sequel? Did it live up to your expectations, or did it not? Ooh, I think that... I overall, I want to say that I really enjoyed this movie. Um, I love this, I guess, franchise. Mm -hmm. The first um, How to Train Your Dragon was one of my favorite animated movies of all time. I absolutely love it. I own it. I watch it probably more times than I should every year. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> but so I had really, really high expectations, um, and I found found myself being a little bit hypercritical. Um, during the first couple of scenes like I was smiling crazy when they did that big dramatic flight scene in the beginning and They had the dragon the clouds and like I, I had this huge grin on my face, but then as soon as kind of the more um, Talking conversational scenes started happening. I did find myself Overanalyzing so I had to kind of like be like remember to just kind of Imagine and let it be free and stop thinking so much um but overall, I was very happy. It was very hard to let go of all the expectations I had built up, though. Okay. Interesting. Um, yeah, no, th th this movie pleasantly surprised me. It's, uh, for me, personally, it's very tough to make an animated sequel and make it work. Um, and my, the, you know, my humble opinion, for whatever I know, uh, for whatever it's worth, you know, there's only been a few. Like, you know, to me, the Toy Story trilogy is, if you're going to talk about animated that's the best animated trilogy you're going to find. I mean, near perfect screenplays on each one story-wise, hard to compare to that. And there's been a couple of other animated sequels that have been okay, but for the most part, you know, you can get burned because it's a money grab. And, you know, I'll go back to Pixar Cars 2, to mm -hmm. me was a very big disappointment. I was such a huge fan of Cars. So going into this one, mm -hmm. I didn't <clears throat> quite... You know, I, I went in with with not a, a, a huge expectation. I, I, I most certainly enjoyed the first movie. I thought they created a fantastic world, and it was fun, and it had a good story to it. And ultimately, that's what it comes down to. You need a good story. Uh, and then as I was watching this movie, I, I found myself like pleasantly surprised, and I was grinning, and I was like, you know, in the end, I, I can nitpick certain things, but um, there were certain plot points that, yeah, I get it. You, This is going to move the story this way. But I found that the story, its message, uh, I really, like, you know, I ended up enjoying it. And I said, you know, they, they came up with a good story. And looking for what we have coming up to the, you know, for the rest of the year, like, this could potentially be nominated for Best Animated Feature because, well, Absolutely. we don't have a Disney movie this year. We don't have a Pixar movie this year. So this one right now, for me, is standing out. I, I think it's... Uh, you know, I think it's I think it's a solid film. I, I agree. Solid. I mean, I was a huge fan of the first one when it came out in 2010. How to Train Your Dragon 1 was actually my first 3D film that I saw in theaters. Oh. So I, I really enjoyed the experience. It was more enhanced the first time I saw the first yeah. movie. So I loved it from the beginning. And then, you know, you mentioned Toy Story and that franchise. I actually, because Toy Story 3 and How to Turn Your Dragon came out in the same year, different times of the year, but it was like the same time. And I actually thought How to Turn Your Dragon was better than Toy Story 3. I mean, hate me. Blasphemy, I do. I know, but <laughs> I personally, that, that, I don't really. that was my personal opinion. I yeah. thought, you know, Toy Story 3 at that point was a bit overhyped and a bit overrated. And Toy Story, they're great films. I love them too. But I thought How to Train Your Dragon was so original, and it was new. It was a new animated franchise that kids can latch on to, and also the adults, too, because we love pets, and then having dragons 
you know, portray anything of mm-hmm. the cat dog like characteristics, we're gonna, you know, uh, admire that, and that that's always fun to watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if I have to pick a side between Toy Story and How to Train Your Dragon. I'm gonna pick out a junior dragon. Yeah, Me you're too. both you're both out of your minds. Me too. I mean, <laughs> from a screenplay, even from a screenplay, but but, I, but doesn't Toy mean I love you less. <laughs> Toy Story is a great franchise. No, I'm not saying I disliked mm-hmm, yeah. it, but I really did enjoy How to Train Your Dragon for yeah, especially exactly. being original. And Toy Story has already been out for ten years, mm-hmm. and then having something new and fresh to animation, I really appeal to that. Yeah. No, I you know the first the, the first How to Train Your Dragon for me was 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 a very nice, pleasant surprise. I didn't. Uh, you know, I had heard, I mean, it was getting good reviews, uh, it was getting very good will, and, uh, you know, when I saw it, I was like, I was impressed, and it looked great. Uh, you know, it wasn't my first 3D movie. Uh, <laughs> my first 3D movie in theaters was something called Coming At Ya. Yeah, look it up. But in any case, <laughs> um, you know, it, it looked great, but, you know, and part of the reason, too, is, you know, we'll talk about them a little bit later, but they had, you know, they brought aboard um, Roger Deakins. As a cinematographer, this guy's worked with the Cohen brothers and such. I mean, he's a great cinematographer, and they brought him on to consult because they were filming in 3D. And so that's, you know, the movie just looked uh, amazing and it did really well. Uh, unfortunately, for How to Train Your Dragon, it was co- it, that, that first one was coming out at a time too when 3D was sort of kind of getting a bashing, where mm-hmm. not every movie was, you know, really good at 3d but i think how to train your dragon was very good in 3d and i will say i did see how to train your dragon 2 in 3d and again beautiful like i would recommend the the upcharge ticket price because i thought it looked fantastic amazing yeah i mean i i love this movie so much i want to go back and see Mm. it in 3d um but i want to talk a little bit of just the beginning of remaking the second one because when they made the first one it was about a month after its release that they were already in talks to make a second one and then they jumped at that opportunity and the director Dean DeBlois 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 I'm gonna butcher his name we'll call him Dean for the sake of (laughs) thanks Dean (laughs) Dean the director he mentioned that if he was going to do a sequel it should be in a trilogy like Sure. Setting mm-hmm. that the first one, the three parts of his story. Sure. And he and just to justify doing a sequel, because a lot of people know sequels may not always live up to the first one. And so he, he says if he wants to do it, it has to be part two of you know, part threes. Right. So and I, I liked how I liked how he approached that and how everyone was still back on mm-hmm. board for the second one. I agree and I think it's very gutsy. Um it's a gutsy proposition to say. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, especially in today's, you know, they had a, they did have a phenomenal success with How to Train Your Dragon, the first one, globally. Yeah, it did around five hundred million worldwide. That's you know, that's a lot of spondulics right there. So you mm-hmm. can make a sequel, but still, to make a sequel to an animated feature, it's still a risky proposition. And to, mm-hmm. and for a director to say, I'll only be involved if we make this a trilogy because if, if we make two right, more, films. Right, we got to make two more. And, you know, for a studio to say, you know, and again, I, you, we can look back. It, it's sort of kind of fascinating because the first How to Train Your Dragon, if I'm correct, was released via Paramount Pictures. Uh, that's who DreamWorks had their distribution deal with. Um, and now a lot's changed. Uh, their distribution deal now is with 20th Century Fox. Uh, things have changed since then. But for Fox to say or Katzenberg, who oversees and yeah. goes, OK, you know what? I have enough faith in you that you, okay, you're good to go with two more movies, and we'll see where that gets us. But uh, yes, I greenlight, you know, I greenlight a trilogy. That's gutsy. That's very gutsy, especially for so long ago already, because you don't Absolutely. know how well the the first one's going to track yet, and sure. how well the second one might even mm-hmm. track, let alone a third. Right. So that mm-hmm. that says a lot of faith in Dean as a director. Absolutely. And the story and, and the content that they're writing with. Absolutely. Uh, you know, couldn't agree more. So, you know, and I think for this one being his middle story, I, I you know, we were talking just before we, we hit action that, <laughs> and, you know, he's uh, his, he's a big Star Wars fan. Mm-hmm. And his favorite movie, the one that as a kid really affected him was Empire Strikes Back. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this one, 
had, I, I see, yeah, Empire Strikes Back is a great film, uh, but I would argue too that it's not a complete movie. This one, to me, I think this one was a more complete movie. Empire leaves us on a cliffhanger, mm-hmm. right? Han, You're we don't expecting another one. Well, but Han Solo's in Carbonite somewhere. Uh, you have to go get him. Luke Skywalker just found out that Darth Vader's his dad. He's got to cope with that, and the movie just ends. Mm-hmm. This movie did have a clear ending. Um, but knowing that, okay, so how are we going to deal with Hiccup now that he's chief? So you could see that when they go ahead to make the third, where progression can go. But as this was a self-contained movie that had a beginning, a middle, and an end, end. you know? Completely. And so I, I agree with you where it's a little bit different. To me, they've all been kind of standalone and thirds preparing itself to be a standalone which is good to bring in new audiences and mm-hmm. it's good so that it really does open it up but i don't know it's like for me searching for that next chapter mm-hmm. there are windows there are little indications but there's no big i guess in a way overarching problem like there is in star wars oh, right yeah. i mean there there isn't the cliff like we weren't left mm-hmm. on how to train your dragon with say loose threads if for whatever silly reason Mm-hmm. They don't make the third for whatever, you know, we don't know what the, the, mm-hmm. the hands of fate will, will say. This one is self-contained. Like, there's no, it answered all of the questions that it raised throughout, and it didn't really leave many threads. Like, you can go, you can move forward from where our characters are. Absolutely. But there were no questions. Like, And, and the great and thing about good. this, the sec, the sequel, that all the characters were mostly, especially Hiccup, definitely had a character arc. Oh, and absolutely. And you saw it from the beginning to the end oh, of this hell, film. Yeah. And that's what helped make it a standalone because he did have the full arc. And then you can go from there afterwards for the third one. And I love just just the testament of the writing mm-hmm. and how they decided to start the sequel off five years later because right. he's now 20 years old. They have confirmed he's 20. So he's in that that awkward stage of you know becoming an adult, but he doesn't really want to because he still has that youthful side to him. He has his freedom. He's content with his life and just going off to different places of the world and exploring and having sure. that freedom. But trying, in, you know, his father's stoic, and I I like the relationship now in this film. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it is still a bit here and there, but they have better mutual understanding of each other. Sure. And respect. Yeah. And so to see Hiccup now fighting off, you know, avoiding life mm-hmm. ch- things that he has to grow up in that way, I liked how that was a storyline that they can play with. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And... You know, I mean, it, plus the five years makes sense because I think, wasn't it about four years ago? 2010, in, yeah. Right. It's been so, four years. So it's been four years. So five years makes sense. I think for me, one of the one of the great things about this movie and Hiccup's character arc, too, is that he loses. Like, he, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, he goes off. He's not, he goes off thinking he can, he can is, change the world. He thinks he's found and, himself at 20 as being this peacekeeper right and, and that's how he identifies himself yeah he was and, already a different character because in the first one everyone didn't like him he was that right outcast. he was the outcast and now right. he's the town hero right and you know but but he was also uh, he he you know placed this burden that he could do anything mm-hmm. like he you know and i can fix this i can make peace i can convince so and so i can do this and you know there was a lot of i and and what i liked about it um is that he learns, you know, he learns and, and he earned it here in his stripes. But OK, I maybe I can't do this, but I know what I'm good at. But I know I need support of friends, family, whatever. Mm-hmm. It's a very great message to send if people are paying attention and the kids like it's it's a very good message. So even if you're a young kid, you can watch it a little bit later on as a teenager. You might get something else out of it. If you watch it as a, as an adult, you go, wow, that's actually sort of kind of clever mm-hmm. how Dean wrote that in, and he really gave. He didn't cheat his characters out in the sequel, and yeah. he gave them good heft and weight, and he did a good job. And I think that's again as I was watching the movie, I was like going. Good job. Like it's this this mm-hmm. sort of kind of reminds me of what a good Pixar movie 
should be like you have to start off with the story and once that happens your characters fill out that story and you buy into it so yeah, yeah one of my good. favorite things that they did with the characters and this is going to go back to what Misha was saying about stoic and hiccups relationship where you do feel like there is this big change of like he does respect him. He does love him. He has built up all these expectations. But you still do get that classic problem in the first one where they still have a problem listening to each other. Right. Absolutely. So it's almost like, <clears throat> yeah, their hearts have opened up. Their relationships have changed. But they still are horrible communicators. It just mm -hmm. works slightly differently. Right. Like they still cut off each other's sentences. They still constantly are dealing with this battle of I need to tell you something and not listening and backwards and forth. So I like that it wasn't just completely changed and right. everything was all better right. they still were working on mm -hmm. their relationship i and i like that the hints they would throw to the original yeah absolutely and also i loved how you know they played off with hiccups still trying to find himself because when you're a young adult you're still trying to have that self-awareness of who you are and who you want to be in life and then to bring his, the mother character in, because of course we have, I mean, I think Disney has really hit it over the head with us that, um, you know, the main characters don't really have both parents. And this is DreamWorks. And we had in the first one that, where was the mother? And right. then I loved how they did bring the mother into this story and to right. add another layer to Hiccup and might have the audience understand him better that maybe his dragon whispering side did come from his mother. Maybe it yeah. was an inherited trait. Yeah, I mean, it totally, I mean, I took it as that's a complete hereditary. Now you know where he gets it from. Yeah. Um, now yeah, we can understand it. it. Go okay. ahead. I was just going to say, like, I do think that it was more than that. He was trying to, as much as he thought he was the peacekeeper, he was still trying to find his full self. And his mother represented one part of maybe, I don't think it actually was a being good with dragons characters. It was more of the need for freedom, yeah. need for kind of that ability to not just see everything by the rules, but look for other options. Right. And like that was the genetic trick that I thought that they shared was really that like embracing of being free of adventure and of you know not wanting to just completely step in line and follow and yeah. that willingness to speak up that's what i thought he got from her and i like that it wasn't just like oh these two people are just magically skilled with dragons yeah it was more yeah. based on like a heart thing than like oh absolutely it wasn't a magic with... yeah it wasn't yeah. midichlorians yeah, yeah. exactly it wasn't it. like no. we have absolutely. a special bond it was like both of them in their own separate way correct earned it and it came from their both this desire for freedom for looking for a sign of ways yeah. to change I things I, yeah and i think it was also the the vision of having the bigger picture and looking at everything instead mm. of the one negative thing that yeah. maybe these dragons are more like us and we don't realize it and having the sure. the you know the um option to be more open to something that you might be afraid of up front because these dragons are big and scary but that doesn't mean that they don't have feelings that we can't you know emotionally get attached to them and you know have that empathy for these right. type of characters as well yeah and you know we'll all go back to the mother once again because again i like the fact that they bring her in this is where my 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 story sense of the movie sort of kind of i was having sort of kind of issues with be, you know with the mother well yeah because vodka? yeah vodka <laughs> vodka <laughs> um, vodka, vodka. Uh, you know uh, i just felt that um i don't know how they were going to broach it in this but it was almost there was almost too much easy acceptance because she abandoned them I mean, yeah. she abandoned she her did. baby yeah. and, you know, and she, she was thought to be dead and she never came back. And, you know, from, 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 from the father's standpoint too, it's like, you've been alive all this. I didn't find that that was truly the hum human emotional beat response. Like, right. response to that. Yeah. So that, that's my nitpick of the movie. Everything works out and, and it's not that I didn't buy the relationship. I just felt like, Jesus, you you pretty much you hightailed it out of here and you yeah, never you came back them. and you abandoned me with this son. I tried to raise like there was no I tried to raise him as best as I could. And now you're coming in, you're you're filling his mind up with whatever and doing this and you know there was none of that. And 
for good or for bad, I just felt mm-hmm. something I, should have been in there. I kind of, I agree with you. And I think that what pointed it out most to me is that I had to go in this movie really prepared that we were going to meet her. Mm-hmm. And they did that a lot with advertising. Like they did. Mm-hmm. all the advertising was like, oh, your mother it wasn't a surprise exactly and i kept thinking i was like if i had gone into this movie thinking that it was more about you know this dragon army Mm -hmm. and about him finding his mom i would have been shocked yeah i would have been like what i thought like it would have been so confusing and it wasn't completely supported so i felt like they had to like feed us that through advertising to kind of fill those holes to get us so prepared because it's kind of off the wall like it was a very in a way open hole from the first movie where they didn't exactly clarify right so they did have the chance to expand upon that but at the same time it was it was rushed in a way yeah there was just never like rush all the encounters i don't necessarily buy i haven't seen you in 20 years and you're just as beautiful as the day you walked out in my life Mm -hmm. you know i mean i was expecting a little more there that that's, said, that's understandable. Also, just to touch a little bit, um, because also we see Hiccup's reaction, and he was very open to it. And it might be because he was also an actor, still trying to find that acceptance from everyone that mm-hmm. you know who he is. Sure. And then also, but being a twenty-year-old guy, Sorry. good chances you're gonna probably respond upset and angry. But this is a ch- kids type no, of movie, I and I think. You know, going off with an angry reaction wouldn't set well mm-hmm. with the audience that is actually watching it. Mm-hmm. And instead, so they just understand. made her remote, remorseful. That's yeah. what they did. They took the tactic of, okay, well, if they're not going to be angry, yeah. then we need to make her sad. Feel and bad. I do think that they did yeah. that well. Yeah. I do think that, especially when she was with Stoic, like, they did try and put the sense of shame. Mm-hmm. They did do the, like the whole flinchy thing and her not being used to it, and not really knowing what to do, and the con- consistent like apologies. So I did appreciate that they put forth that effort. Like, okay, well at least we have to we have to show that this is an effective thing, and they can't just all be one happy family all together because right. that would have driven me crazy. Yeah, like if she was just like happy all- about it, sure, then you would have been like, this is not realistic. Yeah. You would have gone back. But at least that there was some sort of shame, I was willing to give them a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and I, I there I was agree. remorse like, there. And again, it wasn't anything that 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 kept me from liking the movie as much as I did. I just felt that it was something missing that was actually never brought up at all. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, th- there are other aspects of relationship between parents and, and you know son and father and mother mm-hmm. and you know which which I enjoyed. And then 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 of course, you know, uh, the other thing that the marketing Mm-hmm. put forth too is that and, and again we could we could talk about marketing in a bit but it said that uh this movie was going to be a little bit of a different experience than the first one and they really you know i mean i knew going into this movie they said you know i'd read about it and oh this is gonna this is darker this is darker than the first movie this 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 has thematically it's a little it's heavier than the first movie and whatever and um it hit emotional beats harder especially yeah. for maybe because the characters are growing up, that the people who are watching are also growing up and can handle. Yeah, it. but I was I was really expecting like dark, but like because really dark, dark. Well, but the th- I was waiting for this to happen. I was like, so far, I don't I don't understand what people are saying, and I don't understand why they would think this could keep people away. But then the third act happens. Yeah, and you know when 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 the father gets killed, mm-hmm. and he gets killed by by um toothless. by toothless. And, you know, I was like, oof, okay, this is where it gets, this is where it gets dark. But here was my thing. Um, I was like, okay, really? Like, are we so sensitive like, that we're really calling this dark? I mean, because Bambi's mother gets killed right mm-hmm. at the beginning of Bambi. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have seen dark in animated movies. Look what happens in Aladdin. Like, dark <laughs> things happen in animated movies. It's, it's not that we, you know, to me, I was like, okay, if this is what they're calling dark, then maybe some people have become way it too was, sensitive like you know not every movie can be like a madagascar right mm-hmm. uh, you know it's, it was it literally have... the scene from tarzan yeah like yeah, tarzan yeah. when he like finally accepts him and lion he, like, king too yeah, yeah and yeah but like the dad exactly right. they accept their kid and they get pushed out of the way and i was like we have seen that i thought it was actually i thought the, there was a really dark moment in the first movie in the original how to train your dragon i thought that it was quite a statement to have 
the dad in a way be so have stoic be so repulsed by his son and sit, basically say you're not my kid for a while uh-huh. oh, yeah. and lock him in in the house that to me mm-hmm. was almost in a way war dark to have this like abandonment of your child sure. and this just owning then the sacrifice happened yes it was toothless who did it but there was the whole excuse of it yeah, the it non-knowing and if I had to give any darkness points, it would be to the fact that they had an actual villain this time that was just unstable, I guess. Like, yeah, no, that's a great way to... Yeah, mm-hmm. he, yeah. yeah he obviously had had such a deranged life that his view on the world was his completely hatred, skewed. Yeah, twisted. And he was not going to yeah, change. So yeah, so that to me was very dark. They, he was just an immovable thing that had no empathy or feeling for like his turn away from stoic death just like oh well yeah. you instead of him yeah i'm not too, yeah. that was more care. dark yeah. than actually and, the action well but you and, know and go ahead oh and i will give it to the writing because yes we saw in the trailer marketing that like we had stoic's mother baka was a big character that we were expected to see but in the trailers i really didn't see this dark force coming mm-hmm. and it building this dragon army i didn't get any of that from the trailer so that was a nice surprise for me and i will give it to the writing to add mm-hmm. that to the story as well that we now have a big enemy we mm-hmm. have to face him and mm-hmm. they're using the dragons because right now the audience has grown to love dragons and love mm-hmm. who they are and love the right. company and now using it using dragons mm-hmm. in a dark way yeah. was that was another nice yeah dark Mm -hmm. story to go off yeah and i think again and i have some things about about dean talking about what he considers it being dark or not but you know i mean the word it may not have been highlighted so much that well i mean i didn't know that anybody was necessarily going to die in the movie Mm -hmm. um but perhaps it was after the con screening that Reviews had come out saying this one plays it a little bit more mature than than mm-hmm. than the first one, which makes sense because our characters are growing, you know. But Dean talks about like the conflict, let's say, or call it in the third act, and he's like, "Yeah, there was some concern that we'd push it until it broke." But for me, conceptually, and this is what I find interesting, I thought Hiccup and Toothless are that core relationship of the whole trilogy, and he's still talking as mm-hmm. a trilogy, and we start with them being inseparable bulletproof symbiotic and the best of friends and to me narratively like how do you introduce there's got to be a conflict and i have to make it extreme and and he we pursued that to the gutsiest extreme but the challenge of making it sympathetic and then he had another challenge i mean toothless is the one that does it so you're talking about the opposite of this being them becoming instead of inseparable friends his choice was enemies enemies. and Mm -hmm. instead of just like it's not just like breaking up Mm-hmm. Like like a romantic comedy, they get together, they break up, they get back together. They he, toothless fell to the dark side. Let's just say if we're going to use <laughs> the much. Star Wars metaphor um, or analogy against his will, too, against his will, which was unfortunate. Mm-hmm. And you know that is an extreme. But to his point, to the you know he said this is what it was. I had to be that extreme because this is how when he snaps out of it. We know there's sympathy. You, you need to. Mm-hmm. You, we still have to like Toothless. Yeah. yeah. You know, we can't hate him. And as mm-hmm. bad of a thing that he did, we have to be sympathetic to that. It wasn't him doing it. And I think he. I think they accomplished it. Especially the in part, the actual right? animation yeah. of Toothless after he snaps out of it, that very tentative, like coming up and probing and nuz like. I yeah. thought that was done so well. Yeah. Like, so all that. I got oh, more worked absolutely. up in this film than honestly fault in our stars, <laughs> which is another <laughs> film. I theaters. completely agree with you. Thank you. Like, I got more worked up in this animated film than that one. I, I Fair enough. I will completely stand by that. Thank you. And it was all at right. this point earlier with Stoic. Well, and you know, and, and again, you do feel when, when Toothless is chased off, like, again, and this is where... Th- Dean's writing succeeds is that we do feel sorry for him and Mm -hmm. but at the same time you understand hiccups you understand both of them you You know so you 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 you, you get it and and then it's how do you resolve this how do you you know hiccup has to mature a little more perhaps or you know 
how do you resolve it? So this is a movie beat for beat when you're introducing conflict. You know, any great screenwriting manual will tell you you got to introduce conflict. And then it's about how do I, okay, how do I resolve that conflict and then come up with the other conflict to keep my story going forward? And Dean does this in an animated movie quite well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably better than a lot of uh, live action movies. Mm -hmm. And also that it's it adds to Stoic's character arc because mm -hmm. now he is literally forced into the position to take on the leadership role sure. and turn everything around mm -hmm. and being that leader, that, that reluctant leader, I guess you can say, to, and to overcome such a sad thing that happened, you know, losing his father. So mm -hmm. he has to be the leader in, in yeah. all that. But um, I did like the the story of even giving the dragons more story that now there's the alpha dragons. Because we saw in the first one, so the queen bee dragon, which, you know, you know, queen bees have the control over their, their hive. Their nest. Sure. Yeah. Their, their nest. And then we also, but it, I like the bureaucratic system of the, the <laughs> dragons that there's even a higher level that we didn't think of the alphas. Right. And I thought that was really an interesting story. I yeah. thought it was great it threw me off for a, for a split second because i was literally like wait um before they introduced the other alpha the mm -hmm. mortal i guess leviathan alpha mm -hmm. i thought that perhaps the queen bee had also been an alpha so i was a little confused until they introduced the second and they obviously have a very similar look besides their coloring and right. so I was a little confused for a because I was like, oh, had Toothless already been under the control of an alpha? And then they kind of did. They separated it even more. And I thought that was really fun to expand their world and to make, you know, it have its own rules. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, it, it was a nice little, as you said, it, it's, it's a development. It's a growth. We learn a little bit mm -hmm. more about dragon lore in this world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not 100% I'm not sure that same rules apply to say uh the targaryen dragons no, you know yeah, but so. but but in this world i mean it makes you know this makes sense and it's just another level of conflict mm -hmm. that you know our heroes have to overcome and mm -hmm. how wh what is the next line of quote unquote alpha so yeah and it was the use of the different alphas because we yeah. had the alpha at the the oasis where yeah. all the dragons are being saved that that dragon used its power for good you know Absolutely. it was, it was them. yes it was protection and he looked out for his own dragons yeah. and then we had the other alpha that used his power for bad and affected all the dragons in a negative way yeah. and it was i loved how they showed the difference of mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. and i thought that was very creative and to just add another layer to dragons to make that hey they're really badass yeah mm -hmm. no it does it does create um another level and then of course with the ending that we get you know, I mean, Hiccup uh, or Toothless has his own arc as well because he is now effectively the alpha. Yes. I mean, alpha so, is. you know, and, you, you know, and we know just from Toothless's character from the last movie and this one that he will be more of the nurturing, you know, he has earned the respect of not only his human counter Viking Park counterparts, but his his dragon brethren so mm -hmm. but it makes sense yeah the loyalty of a dragon is like no other yep mm -hmm. and i i thought that was cool because they are animals mm -hmm. but being going off of the animalistic instinct the leader of his pack sure and that's exactly what tooth with toothless was like and i loved how we even expanded on his character that he had back scales that no one knew of and that helped and then they glowed <laughs> And then he glowed. And, well, to, you know, maybe it was that Super Saiyan kind of thing, you know, going to his super extreme mode when he really does have to protect. And just him elevating as a character, giving him yeah. those more personalities yeah. to the dragon life. Yeah, he went a little Godzilla in the other alpha's ass, mm -hmm. so to speak. You know, <laughs> really? Absolutely. With his atomic thing. But, yeah, no. And, again, with his, his ridges in the back popping mm -hmm. up and... Mm -hmm. Again, it's one of those, again, when when you're plotting, how do I come up with these various things so that I can come back to? So, you know, at the very beginning of the movie when he's trying to fly, mm -hmm. sans, you know, sans toothless and, you know, he he's trying to do that. He's got his special gliding one now. Yeah, what do they call that? Uh, wingsuit. The, the, wingsuit. Yeah, you know, he has his wingsuit and, you know, mm -hmm. but something's just missing. They can't make a turn. And then we know that by the end... He's gonna. They're going to be able as a team. 
work it out and mm -hmm. it's yeah, from they, arc they so. did that twice and try to make sharp turns yes. and they weren't successful yeah. and then when he has the back when he has to find yeah. the back ridges you knew it was gonna happen and on yeah. top of that for it to be very visually similar to the first one where he also is avoiding the giant tail and that's the point where it comes into play it was a callback yeah. to the original absolutely uh, to me it reminded me of like pokemon like how they have like <laughs> levels <laughs> like do you know what i mean i was like oh it's two things yes and his levels look like Pokemon stages. <laughs> it was great. I really liked and it. No, I, t I totally agree. Pikachu, and, uh, <laughs> bless you. What? <laughs> and um, also, a funny thing you mentioned about the, the bird suit, that some of the actual animators on the animation staff, they actually um, parachuted in wingsuit outfits just to understand the the movement the of dynamics, the body yeah, yeah, right. and how, yeah. They, yeah. how the body I mean, moves with yeah, the wings. Yeah. And also for the they lighting. They can't just like, yeah. watch... A the squirrel. thousands of videos about that. No, of course. Yeah. They, had, they had, had to do it. They had yeah, to experience they for this. work. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's research. I mean, yeah. that's terrible work. The, yeah. the fact that they didn't Come have to pay, on. you know, like the thousands of dollars. that would work. I would that's be like, dream. yeah. Oh. And it's, I've always wanted to go in a wingsuit. <laughs> yeah, sweet. I mean, you could go super fast in those. That's, but that's and good. and also it was to help a um, the flying the traditional way on a to, plane for them to realize like the how the sunlight hits the body and like, right. the lighting aspect of that. I thought that was pretty neat. Yeah. No. You know. Um. It was, you mentioned look of the film. I can't. You know. I'm gonna bring this up because maybe I could have been the only one in the theater. I could be the only person. I just ever. The influence that Avatar, I feel, has had on cinema oh, that's my, my has phone been, I was like, yes! Uh, you know, has just been insane what James Cameron has influenced. Like, because I couldn't help but think The Dragon of, Sanctuary? Yeah, the Dragon <laughs> Sanctuary, the way people flew the dragons, the, the, the multicolored dragons, the, the multi-winged dragons, all the different looks, the way that the sanctuary looked. And I'm like going, God, you know... Our cinematic view has so much, like, look, whether you love it or hate it, and I did not hate it in How to Train Your Dragon too. I mean, it no. looked beautiful. I want to ride a dragon. Yeah, and, and it doesn't? looked beautiful. But to me, I just I just found a huge influence over Cameron's avatar mm -hmm. in watching this, and especially in that, even the way the dragon, there were scenes like the way the dragon When they swooped yeah. down along the right-hand side yeah. at that one pillar yes. ridge, I was yeah. like, yeah, whoa, yeah. I've seen this shot before. Yeah, but... Um, Again, hey, if you're going to uh, you know, do it good, do it well, and, you know. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And I think that the inspiration is obviously there. Yeah. Um, colors were even there. Oh, my God, the color. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it, yeah. But it was. It, it was amazing. The, the fact that they did it and, like, it was a callback to me, but I was like, oh, but they do have their own little spin on it. Absolutely. And they've kind of embraced it into their artistic form. And I was like, and it looks good. Yeah. So you can get away with it because it looks so it beautiful. And I think they both look beautiful. And if you put them next to each other, you could see their difference. I was like, okay, that's, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a good I love. I agree. I love how, because in the first film, it was so big and vast already. And mm -hmm. we were learning dragons and their abilities. And now it's just, dragons are integrated into this culture. We know them. Mm -hmm. We've accepted them. We have games with them, you know, the dragon racing. Mm -hmm. So it's like... It's like living in LA with, but without. So kind of like quit it, but in a way, but it's, <laughs> inspiration. It, it's an acceptable thing because everyone Absolutely. has a dragon. Now. Oh sure. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's kind of like, if you didn't have a dragon, you were an outcast. I right. mean, what's wrong with you? That's like living in, in LA and not having a car. Right. So you know, it's it's something that like everyone has now, and I loved how they build upon that, mm -hmm. and then the different personalities that they added to the dragons. Yeah, and and, and again, it just expanded upon the world. Like we we learn more about the universe. We mm -hmm. learn more about the world. I also find it very interesting that, you know, you can look at Hiccup it's a couple of ways. Number one. You know, we talk about he was searching for himself. Well, what's he doing? He's an explorer always searching. He's searching for new lands. But I love the fact that he was an explorer, that he was looking for, instead mm -hmm. of playing the reindeer games or the dragon games, mm -hmm. you know, he was out exploring. He was trying to find new lands. He was trying to, and he had his map and how and, he would jot it down. And <laughs> this was called stinky armpit land. Or, yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's the call, too. I think that, in general, Besides, if you just take people's interpretation of Vikings, right? the fact that he didn't really embrace the, f <coughs> you know, fight everything aspect, but the uh, the wandering to new places, sure. to finding new places, very yeah. much a Viking value. Sure. 
So they mm-hmm. used that for him to really link on to his culture. I liked. Yeah. And I thought it, and I liked how it also was expanded by his mother, like the scene where they have his map. Right. And she just mm-hmm. like blows it out of the water. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But but again, and I think that, that harkened back to, you know, the hereditary, mm-hmm. you know, you had a mother who, you know, Instincts. was an explorer. She mm-hmm. loved the world outside, you know, outside of... Uh, the hometown. Uh, mm-hmm. I forget what it's called. But Burke. 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 So, you know, and you see more of the bonding and the connection over there. Um, so that's why I think, you know, with what they've done, I'm interested to see the next chapter to see how the world expands mm-hmm. and to see what, what new things I can learn and see. And yeah. I think that stuff. one thing that um, just some reading interviews it was like they were, they love to put in lines that don't completely make sense and then use those for inspiration points Uh so i mean this is kind of prediction oriented but i don't know so it can't be considered a spoiler but it's like they have they were still putting them in like it was mentioned three times that toothless might be the last of his kind it was mentioned like three times that him and astrid are supposed to get married (laughs) so it's the repetition the things that are left kind of Open. open that theme of love which we haven't really fully conquered yet i think will probably be a big yeah. play yeah in the future at least yeah you know let's talk a little bit about the the characters now mm-hmm. we have a lot of the voices coming back gerard butler stoic of course jay barashel back as hiccup mm-hmm. america Ferrer. we i loved That's how amazing. they they did get the original cast members sure. back and then a little bit more yeah i mean kate blanchett playing vodka the mother yeah, she was great great choice i think that they did some really good casting and i was reading something that america Ferrer said and she just was so thankful that they went outside of um type for her voice mm-hmm. because it, she just really embraced the role and it is i think that her voice does fit the character, but it does go into casting where you have to think about all the components. Like people have to be able to automatically contribute that what the character is just through sound, not through their looks. And sure. I think that each person does it really well. Like Kate Blanchett was picked because they wanted her to both enable that regal, royal, commanding sound while also being able to be very vulnerable. Yeah. And that's a very hard dynamic and I think she did do that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think as an actor, she has that broad range to convey that emotion, even through voice. And I thought that was great. And also, Dean, the director, you know, confronted Kate Blanchett at the 2011 Academy Mm -hmm. Awards. He was like, I wrote this part specifically for you. And it was fortunate that Kate Blanchett's characters were, uh, sorry, characters, um, her sons were big fans of the first one, and so was she. So she was definitely on board. Yeah. What did you guys, how did you feel about... um, Vodka and Stoic's song, because that's an interesting component. Their courting song. Their courting song. Did you? Were you expecting it? Did it make you feel like you're going into a different movie? I, I honestly, I wasn't expecting it because I don't know if that was an actual tradition in mm-hmm. Norwegian. I looked tradition. up at. I mean, Vikings. It, there's not a lot of recorded history about Vikings, but they do say the music was a huge part of their everyday life. So it was used not just, it was used in work, it was used in festivals, it was right. used in every day, all the time. So I think that that was kind of an accurate portrayal because it was such a vocal cor- um, culture versus like writing things down. Yeah. Um, to me, it was interesting because I know Gerard Butler as. A singer that's how i was introduced yeah. to sure. him. phantom phantom <laughs> opera and so i was like i was a little confused because i was like oh we're gonna hear gerard butler singing it's gonna get really good <laughs> and i was like um Very this is guttural. more yelling yell talking and i was like what an interesting choice like mm-hmm. that they had this great singer and they were just like nope stay this character does not sing he yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, but, but I'm glad that, that they that didn't choice. go with that mm-hmm. though because yeah because it would have taken the audience out because people mm-hmm. who know him from Phantom of the opera would expect this operatic mm-hmm. voice and that wasn't the case and oh. that really fit with his character stoic a guy who you wouldn't really think would burst out in song like that he his name lives up to his reputation but, stoic but I, I, even more so than that to this isn't this isn't a musical like this mm-hmm. isn't it's a, not a disney film yeah well it, but yeah it's not it, this isn't a musical so 
had it gone to that level that would have like really put the brakes on and 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 put a halt to this because it would have come out of nowhere number one um we're not primed for it because there's been no music so to speak outside of score and there's been you know and outside of like in the town of burke there might be some music and dancing and during the festival or whatnot but but it's not characters aren't perpetuating the plot through music Mm -hmm. so this one scene if they're trying to make it look a little more traditional like it didn't bother me you know it was it was i found it to be a touching moment and i said you know but i still said well it's not a musical but through music through the courting i could Mm -hmm. see that this is within this world's history that Mm -hmm. they did 20 plus years ago so and they're just redoing their vows i guess in a sense Mm -hmm. exactly i think it was like they're making up for all the lost time that they could have had together and this was their one big moment yeah. that they could celebrate being a family together right. until we get to mm-hmm. act three where it, you know the samurai the family literally separates and gets right. split apart mm-hmm. so i really didn't mind that they had this courting song mm-hmm. it was it was a nice calming down slowing down moment from all the overwhelming dragons and whatnot i was like all right family time let's enjoy this mm-hmm. before we go back out into the and world. it was pulling the family together as well uh you yeah. know is bringing the family back together after this absence and it does it in a sweet way and you buy into it and once the courting scene everybody is happy mm-hmm. family together Yay. again and yeah and you know if you, you were feeling uh it felt good you know it was nice and and uh hiccup was getting what he wanted you know he got he was getting his family, and he yeah. still had Toothless as part of his family, too. Yeah, and I want to talk about the the other characters. I mean, we had Drago, um, voiced by Daimon Hansu. I'm trying I was to like, I was, I was like, I was like, I'll let you attempt yeah. that name. Daimon Hansu. I mean, he's a great actor in and of himself, and I, I really liked how he brought his soft, guttural, really commanding yeah. voice to it because this is his first voice animation for any project mm-hmm. that he's mm-hmm. ever done, and he thought it was a great experience. Uh, um, Did we like him what? as the Drago? Yeah, I didn't even know it was uh, uh, Damon <laughs> uh, Hintu uh, at all. And I thought he did a really good... He played off, what do we call it, his craziness. Mm-hmm. I thought he played off very well. Um, so yeah, casting him I thought was a really, really good yeah, it was a good choice. I thought that he did a really good job with the role, just like yeah, his voice resonated really well with that character. It was a good match. Um his storyline, I completely bought that he was, you know, a little bit twisted and right. very angry. Right. I was a little interested in kind of the aspects of his history that they dove to spend a lot of time on and the ones they didn't. Cause to me they spent a really good amount of time with his whole entering into the chamber of chiefs with his dragon skin cloak and it was like this big huge ordeal and i was just kind of confused like why that was i thought that for me saying that very shortly like he killed all the chiefs without mercy is one thing versus like they just sped over how he became like the ruler of this mm. alpha mm. like they completely sped over like exactly how he lost his arm and how he lost his family it was done in like two sentences and i was like wait how did you get this army where have you been how did you get that thing under your control how did you get to point b well exactly. i mean I was, he- so i was a little like what I saw, you know, well, interesting because as I was watching the movie, I sort of kind of looked at him as a, of a, almost of a of a offshoot, an extension of like a Captain Ahab. You know, mm-hmm. he truly, you know, his white whale is the dragons. Uh, he was maimed by a dragon, much like much like Hiccup, and they made that parallel clear. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I thought it was a twist. A good, you know, I didn't when he took his arm off, so you can understand his anger there, and his his having control over what. Having can you know his having control over what scares him mm-hmm. or what people fear and 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 inflicting that fear upon you know dragons that's what they do they inflict fear and I am going to control that fear and unleash it you know I'm going to yeah, build I'm gonna an army control it before it controls me yeah and mm-hmm. I'm going to unleash that fear in the world around me because I'm just you know crazy now I, I only make that extension because Ahab 
lost his leg to a, to, to the white whale, to mm-hmm. Moby Dick, mm-hmm. and his was vengeance. And in a sense, I looked at Drago's, um, his thing was out of vengeance. I mean, he was just a mean, but he was psycho. He was nuts, mm-hmm. and he was yeah. unmoving, as you said I earlier. guess he was almost just like, I would have been more interested to visually see like a flashback of him retaining his alpha or losing his arm and his family versus the stoic impression well, I just, memory other, like i i don't know it was, it was just an interesting for me like the, that was the section they chose to focus on well i i sort of took it too though um there was a scene in which he um uh he he overcomes a dragon mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and Again, the direct parallel is this is how Hiccup does toothless along with his mom. You know, there's 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 a love, there's a bond, mm-hmm. there's a feel. His was pure, like how do you beat a bad dog? His was you control. put the dog under the heel, mm-hmm. like he stepped on its head, he mm-hmm. took control. Like he became I- the alpha. And I just assume that in one way, shape, or form he found the way to 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 have the alpha submit exactly like, in yeah, a sense. That was but, his but way it was of through control. bad dog training it, and it reminded mm-hmm. me of the how stoic treated toothless in the first in the first movie yeah. when he overcame him and it was yeah. that like switch the ground chain yeah chain to a boat yeah like it, you did see the parallels there and how to bad train your dragon <laughs> exactly <laughs> um and also along with jagga we had his minion Eret. Eric. Voiced by Kit Harrington and mm-hmm. Sarah, you're a big yeah. Game of Thrones fan. Um, I didn't re- recognize his voice. Neither did I. I, d- <laughs> I honest, didn't recognize did him. I. I was like, what? I was like, wait, who who did Kit play? <laughs> like, I literally, it's hard for me to even recall like his voice. Like, they just didn't mash up in my head. I'm not saying he didn't do a good job. Like, I actually really like the yeah. character. I just didn't put the actor to the to it so i was like really thrown back when i read that um shows he's a great actor and mm-hmm. voice actor as well, well yeah i didn't i didn't realize this it was, was his him. first voice animation mm-hmm. project yeah and uh, i didn't realize it was him and then i found this great thing because he was asked to do it um and he was originally asked uh hey because harrington developed a swedish accent for the character after talking with dean they said so he did he developed a, an accent for it and then the the <laughs> as as usual the case B, they clashed with the studio because they felt that his accent and even inflection sounded too close to Hiccup, to Jay Burch Howell's mm-hmm. voice. So he had to go back to the drawing board and he was like, well, what if I then do two sides of my own English accent? He's like, I could do the well-spoken side of my parents in a more working class London where he lives. So he opted for a version of the latter. And so hence that, that that's how he came up with his I didn't know it was him until, like I said, I was like, oh, well, hey, good for him. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I thought his and, character was a little, very interesting. I never thought that I could feel as much random subtleties from um, the animated characters so much. Because I put it in my head that him and Astrid kind of had a thing. <laughs> like, I don't know. Oh, really? Maybe. Oh, because I didn't see that at all. Oh, no, I didn't. I, it, I don't think it was actually there. I think like, <laughs> it I imposed that impression on them. And I was like, they've made no hint that these two have feelings for each other. But, but I maybe literally you want felt to that way. And I was like, <laughs> that's something that very much happens in live action where right. you see the chemistry of two actors and you're like, oh, I they think they could have. They hate each opposites attract. Yeah, you're mm-hmm. like, I think they could have a thing. And I was imposing my own feelings on <laughs> Anna animated characters in this movie and i'm just like i was like oh, no this is animation they would have told me they would have said something but um because the whole time obviously you have all <laughs> the, a lot. oh my gosh i'm totally forgetting her name the twin oh uh, refna and T- tuffet yeah so yeah. you have her like pining for him and i'm like right. but he's really attracted to astrid and i'm like that's not there the mm-hmm. drama is not in that movie but in my opinion it was I, I did l- that's that's fine i don't know that's maybe funny. yeah it's just my underlying wanting what, some drama what, were you, what did you have before you saw the movie no <laughs> it worked <laughs> i did i did enjoy how they had that um possibility of having that romance 
um, mm-hmm. story with the one of the twins and how yeah. she had the feelings for Eric, and we're yes. like, no, that's not good. No. <laughs> and um, mm-hmm. but it was comedic in that sense. Yeah. And it was a good yeah. subplot to have kind of them still have character involvement versus just playing, you know, the backup or the friends like. They're not trained anymore. They haven't really taken... They're not in leadership positions. No. So giving them something that kind of united them and added to the sure. plot, I thought it was, and, a, it was a smart little And twist. again, that character could have just been the typical henchman. I mean, that's what mm-hmm. he was. That's what he is. He's a henchman to this Drago character, but to to Hiccup's credit, you know, we have... We do have at least one bad character change. Mm-hmm. We do have, you know, the where he convinces character. him. And Hiccup does, in fact, convince him about dragons. And it's proven when, I believe it's Hic- or Toothless that saves him. No, or no, it no, wasn't no. Toothless. It's Astrid's it was dragon. Astrid's okay. dragon saves, you know, saves him. And, you know, it, 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 he's a nice addition mm. to the cast going forward. He's a good, mm-hmm. you know, because in a sense he could be the Han Solo-ish. He's the rogue. He's the, yeah. you know... You know. He has a and little. He's he's different than all of them. Yeah. He has a different upbringing than all of them. Right. And, yeah. and as much as we've seen all of these, I'm going to call them trainees because that's what they were in the first film. Say they're big and bad. Right. And like can do all the They never really any good. And yeah. he's kind of the first one who's come in and was actually uh-huh. arrogant for a reason. Yeah. Like he is a good trapper, and so. I thought that was a fun sure. to put someone else who is actually in a way skillful. Yeah, back and in the mix. I liked how they played the twin with that, and she was kind of like the voice for the audience, being like, "Oh, I was rooting for you because you were you seemed like a cool guy, but now you're a mean guy." Right. And then it was that that whole back and <laughs> That's forth. True. And I loved uh, how they played with that mm-hmm. with the audience, and and yeah, we were rooting for this bad guy Eric mm-hmm. because you knew he was going to have that he had that internal conflict right. yeah and he realized at the end and he had that character sure. switch too and I thought that was really well done yeah I uh, agree um, I, I also liked you know just the the other fun characters of course we had Craig Ferguson back as Gobber and you know being <laughs> that companion along for the ride running he's, around and, yeah yeah he was uh, he's he's the family member He's almost well. I don't want to call him drunk uncle. I don't want to give it that credit. But he's the he's the lovable family member that you know is looking out for the, for everybody. Mm-hmm. And you know he's got the comedic moments mm-hmm. and he's voiced perfectly by Craig Ferguson. Absolutely. Um, and then yeah. of course we had our two main um, characters. You know with Astrid and Hiccup and how their relationship has blossomed over the sure. five years. Mm-hmm. I mean. I'm surprised they didn't really go more romantically with them. Now we seem that they're at this point where they are content with each other. They're more comfortable. They're, right. you mean, we saw Astrid making fun of Hiccup and like doing his imitations, which is actually right. the only scene that Jay and America Ferreira actually voiced together. Uh-huh. There's the one scene throughout the whole film that they actually yeah. did together. Well, and that was, and those were funny scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, with the, I don't talk like that, and you know, and mm-hmm. Jay Burchell too. Um, he has a particular cadence mm-hmm, in mm-hmm. the way that he talks that is unique, and you know, to lend it to an awkward teenager, twenty year old, you know, it still works. Um, so I think the voice casting in that was was great. We do have to talk about Gobber a little bit, but go. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I love their voice for the characters. I think they match yeah. extremely well. The scene that you're bringing up where, you know, Hiccup's kind of, he's found a new land, Astro joins him, they have right. this conversation, was, I thought it it was cute for the relationship. I thought this was the scene that you could really see that the animators were having a lot of fun with facial expression. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that it was the first point where, I mean, we might get into it, they did use some new technology or made facial expression easier and there was a lot of it and i felt like they were just like okay i can make them do this so easy let's make them have a lot and i was like a little too much guys i understand you're having fun i don't need astrid's face to move every half a second because literally if you watch her as she's listening there's no stillness in her (laughs) (laughs) i was like I was like, what are you doing? I was like, calm down. <laughs> but and, and also added to that, we had the two dragons in the back just playing like dogs and right. having fun. So yeah. it was a that lot was going really cute though. It was a lot going on in that yeah. scene, which was 
Again, Absolutely. I think a testament to just the animators having fun. Exactly. Yeah, they, yeah. Were, they just went a little wild like, on that one. Yay, we're, we're bad for a second one. Let's have fun with it. Yeah, and, you know, again, the animation in this movie, again, I, I don't know what else is coming out. Um, let's, let's get into but, the animation. But, yeah, it? sure. Why not? Um, so, so I know that this film, they had a regular 30 to 40 animators, but up until the last few months, the number would even increase to 50 just, you know, to complete mm-hmm. the film. Sure. But they they used new technology mm-hmm. and um, animation software called Apollo, which immediately it <coughs> helped with the hand-drawn animation. And it was like this program allowed them to have the 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 mix of hand drawn animation stop motion and the possibility of just like editing on the computer all right. together which mm-hmm. helped with the workflow sure yeah and they had other um, technologies as well that did just make things instead of having to actually like click and drag each moment and more of was a um, they had programs that just reflected like skin over muscle how like the wind affects you and things that made it go by quicker and i think when things go back quicker sometimes you add too much or more but overall 90 <laughs> percent of the film was i was like breathtakingly beautiful um i think their flying and cloud work is oh absolutely. amazing yeah Lots every time like the, the two scenes like the opening sequence of really um hiccup and toothless like embracing the, and we just fully accept that they are just the most amazing flight mm-hmm. pair the separate gliding the other um, scene where him and his mother are flying the dragons together and she sure. does all the gliding movement. Oh, yeah. No, that was beautiful. And with the, the reaction lands. of the yeah. air coming up and how oh. they implied all that. It was yeah. consistently, it was gorgeous. Um, so all of that I thought was extremely well. The only scene is the one that, I'll, that, that I point out was just Astrid. And I was just like, okay, maybe it's because we're not having as much going on that you were like, oh, we can play. And again, and I, I, I do think me. that, you know, when you have somebody consulting like a Roger Deakins and when you're, again, this is a little bit more than just converting to 3D. This is this is animating, knowing that you're going to be in 3D and, and, and choosing your environments or drawing the environment so they have the depth of scale that's necessary to make 3D flush and to make it look beautiful. And going back to the Sanctuary of Dragons, I mean, there was a very beautiful, it was a very beautiful land. And and um, uh, uh, even the Alpha's uh, crystal mm-hmm. ice color, like, you know, yeah. that added depth and color palette. And when you're directing for something like that, you, you it's, Again, it goes back. You hire, you hire experienced people to help you to make it look this way. So, from a cinematography level, mm-hmm. you know, it's just like the first one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It looked beautiful, and it creates a world. And again, I'll, I'll going back to Avatar. Mm-hmm. James Cameron knew he was going to film in in three D, and he wanted to create a world that we've never seen before. Mm-hmm. And How to Train Your Dragon 2 here has created a universe, and they they continue to push the envelope, but they don't do it in an um, exploitive kind of a way. It's not like, hey, we're making a 3D movie because we want the extra mm-hmm. catch. It's like, no, we're going to make a 3D movie, and we're going to make it look good. We yeah. want it to look and good. And you can see it to meet themselves. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like the love they have for the just the scenes and the environments they create is so beautiful. And to me, you can see that, especially as they scroll through the artwork at the end credits oh yeah where you get like what they were looking for for each scene and i'm like and they accomplish all that. and i literally would hang that artwork on my walls yeah it's, it's beautiful beautiful, artwork. beautiful. It, it wouldn't Great. surprise me if there was a how to train your dragon to artwork mm-hmm. you know like coffee table kind of a book exactly because oh beautiful. absolutely i would love yeah. that i mean yeah. and Again, going off of they, they just topped themselves and made it even more epic. Their their types of worlds and made it more mm-hmm. grand. That this film actually used seven hundred million digital files, utilizing more than four hundred terabytes of data, which is the most of any DreamWorks animation production <laughs> to date. I got that in my iPhone. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, was, I mean that's crazy. Yeah, no, it is. And okay. well. The, the hours of rendering that they spent over 90 million hours of rendering but let's talk about something i mean you know that all comes with the cost you know the um i mean the production budget alone was 145 million Mm, dollars that's 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 for an animated movie but then when you talk about the total 
budget, including hard drives and advertising. Yeah. Um, you know, you're talking $210 million. 210. When, when, when people make a live action movie at $210 million, you sort of kind of go, whoa, that's expensive. This is an animated movie. So it's um, not like you're paying for locations and yeah, yeah. And you're paying for the technical aspects. Yeah. So all you know, it comes at the cost, and will they make it up? You know, hopefully so. I mean, they have slated a third, so it it's funny because like, <clears throat> do you look at it like from a money perspective? Does it, although we've said this is a standalone movie, mm-hmm. but uh, part of me wants to just be like. But you get you got five hundred million from the first one, like it is worth it for the fans. You've got another one coming out. I think this becomes lasting. I think you do get products out of it. I think you do get people who are going to buy the whole trilogy, and like a lot of money will come from that in the end. Sure. And yeah, maybe the second one didn't make as much money. I don't think that that makes it Yet. a waste. Yeah, Yet. or not worth it because I think the first one kind of earned that potential and shows that there's going to be a growth. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, unfortunately, like you I, I, unfortunately, um, just from a business side, as, you know, aspect side of it, unfortunately, the movie didn't necessarily, in its opening weekend, didn't didn't deliver, didn't live up to what had been expected. Mm-hmm. You know, there and 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 there's history to show that similar movies like A Monsters University, also a sequel, opened up around the same time period and did like you know within the high sixties or so. And this one, which had very good will going towards it because of the first movie, mm-hmm. um, you know, was expected. And not only that, I mean, there was there, there's, there was a lot going for Dragon. Uh, Goodwill because they made a really good first movie, which $500 million worldwide. I don't know what the home entertainment value of it was. Really okay. good. <laughs> so then add to that, there is, this is the first, and it is the, it's the first and really only family animated movie to come out this summer it has no competition from a disney and or pixar movie um, the maleficent coming, is out it's not but, an animated movie but it's not it, no. it's not an animated movie uh it's the only it's the only one of its sort uh right now and 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 you know i know later we're gonna get a planes 2 mm-hmm. sequel we but, get but, also the one with the aliens right later on down but mm-hmm. for summer this was the first one out so they had expected you know more families to to come out i don't know why it's 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 tough because there have been a lot of there's been a lot of writing on it this past week could it have been the marketing did they not did they not um um emphasize more laughs in in the marketing did they i don't know and i don't have an answer myself i expected it to be mid high 60s maybe i, 72. I thought it was going to be number one i was yeah, completely I, standing behind that and, i yeah, thought so too wrong. and and also i mean i I don't like it when numbers bog down a really great film because this was a great film. It had good writing, good good animation, all that. And then to be just have it tainted by numbers that didn't start off as well as mm-hmm. it should have or what people were expecting it to be doesn't shouldn't take away from the film. No, it, it doesn't. It, but I think in this case, because sometimes you, you will talk about, sometimes you talk about a movie, uh, numbers of a movie before it's released. Mm-hmm. That yeah. to me can be somewhat silly. But when expectations are sort of high, and, and who brings up those expectations? Well, I think from an audience standpoint, from my standpoint, you know, someone who looks at numbers a lot, who does a lot of, you know, trying to analyze. And again, it was just like, there's always, coming from the studio side of things, there's always the finger pointing that's going on. Mm-hmm. There's yeah. always the the backstab politics now. And, and who's, bl- well, you didn't do this right, or you didn't market it right, or you didn't do this. And I'm just trying to figure out, like, everybody seemed to do their jobs. I thought the marketing was 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 fine. They didn't make it look like a Kung Fu Panda 2 kind of a movie or anything. Um, I don't know if they could have showcased more laughs. But no, I, I, I loved know. how the very first trailer, teaser, anything of How to Turn Your Dragon 2 that I saw was just the the flying hang... Mm-hmm. Um, flying yeah, scene I, I thought it was when a perfect, they were in the oh. clouds and that's all i needed because it got me excited and i'm like they're making a second one it looks awesome they're flying mm. side by side now this is even better mm. than the first one sure i think that the only way i can look at it or make assumptions about it is like how i view the people in my life are going or not going and i think that as i talk to people i have a lot of friends who want to see it and like this is the first movie they're going to see 
and I have I have family that's you know and just graduating high school and it's not quite summer yet a lot of people are in finals a lot of people are on their last week of school so I'm thinking maybe this will pick up in the next two weeks as people do get on the summer vacation as that all gets into way and that's what I'm hoping for yeah and I also mean- this film opened up with 20 the same week as 22 Jump Street and we had so it had a competition in that way and that was also completely different audience I, I know yeah. but that was also a sequel too yeah. And so people might want to go to that film because that movie got a lot of recognition for being really funny. That was a word mm. of mouth. People wanted to see that. Yeah, my so. only argument about that is that it's apples to oranges. I mean, they're two completely oh, different absolutely. audiences. But and I'm saying it, people does, are it liking, did have competition too. Yeah, to an extent. There was no kids. There was no family. 22 Jump Street is not a family movie. No, it's not. But, you know, <laughs> here's the thing too. When you look at uh, both movies – that we talk about that we're talking about both movies were have been received well by the press i i think uh 22 jump street is in the high 80s on rotten tomatoes uh how to train your dragon 2 94 um yeah. and a cinema score of a mm-hmm. so that's meaning whoever you know the 50 yeah. million the 49 47 million that 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 that, that it brought in people who see how to train your dragon 2 are, are really liking it so much like you know, going both 22 Jump Street and How to Train Your mm-hmm. Dragon 2 are going into their second weekends. The competition is sort of kind of, there's nothing necessarily vying for their business, you know, mm-hmm. uh, although I do think there will be another number one movie going into this weekend mm-hmm. when we come in on Monday. I, I think that How to Train Your Dragon 2 could have a solid hold only because of the goodwill that it has already garnered and from mm-hmm. the other families who may talk to other families going, yeah, my son wants to see it and who knows why they couldn't go out yeah um you know it's just it's you know playing box office derby is mm-hmm. just one of those things and that i do happens. agree with you 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 make a solid point uh for anybody who hasn't seen this movie you know don't let yeah don't let the don't numbers let bug you down what people talk about as being disappointed because sometimes they look, you know, somebody who hasn't seen it, they can hear on the news or they're on their, they're in their car and they're not really p- fully paying attention. And they hear disappointing at the box office this weekend or disappointing showing this weekend. And they don't under, they're not listening to clearly find out. Well, that just means that it didn't get the money. money yeah, that not it, it doesn't mean that it's a bad movie. And this, I think we all agree is a very good movie. Completely. I, I agree. And this movie opened up on Father's Day weekend too. Which so. should have sort of mm-hmm. kind of helped. Yeah, um, yeah. You, know. you, you think it, it would yeah. have, but like again, we had another male-oriented film that came out as well with Twenty Two. Yeah, so, and like, I mean, it was a little before, but like my family, I know my stepdad wanted to see Edge of Tomorrow. That was his like yeah. father's and day. And Edge of Tomorrow is doing good too. I mean, it started off with slow numbers, but then it built. Mm-hmm. So I think the exact same thing will happen with this film that it might not have had the best expected start, but I think. With time we and hope. duration, it will get to that point. Yeah, I mean, I you know, fingers crossed. Again, I just, you know, mm-hmm. looking at what we have in the, you know, look, okay, this weekend, maybe not so much. You know, then we have, you know, then we have this little movie called Transformers, which is probably going to be. Just a little movie. <laughs> yeah, it's probably going to be the biggest opening this summer. And it's interesting because, again, going, starting in May, there were articles that had said, Hey, you know, there's a very good, strong possibility that How to Train Your Dragon 2 could potentially be the big number one movie of the summer. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's it's tough. And again, I, I don't want to, you know, we're talking numbers. Sometimes it's tough to sort of climb out of the hole, albeit it's not a very deep hole. Um, but it's sort of kind of a whole, you know, it's 10 million less or so, 10 to 15 million less. And so you got to make that up. And when you have some other big movies and then some other kids movies like a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you're hoping that your goodwill on this will, Mm -hmm. you're hoping that there's going to be some longevity, uh, throughout, throughout the weeks ahead, but it will have some strong competition and longevity. Speaking of longevity, they kept saying that this is part two of a trilogy. So we're, we're pretty much expecting a third one. And Mm -hmm. as we said, this was a very standalone film. Mm -hmm. I think where they're going to pick up is now hiccup is in that chief position and he's going to 
still go out and be going on his adventures, but like find a, even a bigger conflict to deal with and how he handles it as chief instead of someone trying to. We're meeting another Night Fury. That's yeah. my yeah. theory. Well, I think well there's so too. that, but, but let me ask you this too. I mean, because let's just say it takes another three to four years. What if we met a female Night Fury for a hiccup? You mean for toothless? Uh, I mean, yeah, for toothless. <laughs> now I'd sorry. rather the hiccup I mean, thing. I think that would that would yeah. be a love triangle that I'd be <laughs> but, down yeah. for. <laughs> a, a female night fairy for toothless. I think that would be interesting. Uh, yeah, could be. Well, what if the movie? So, so the so the sequel picks up, or the third, and the trilogy picks up. And what if when we open up, uh, tooth uh, hiccup and um, it does what's her name? Um, Astrid. Astrid are, are getting like married, married, or married. if they're already married. Like, maybe they're in the first year of their marriage. Maybe they're still in the honeymoon period. Who knows? Yeah, I think that I'm wondering. Oh, sorry, Marissa. I just oh, no, go for I think that it, it'll be interesting if we do address the problem of do dragons stick around or do they disappear? Like, it, well, it's funny enough because you, uh, the the story, you know, um, the books of How to Train Your Dragon written by Cressida Cowell, she has a series out. And one of the first lines in the book was like, Back in this time, and dragons existed. So th we started off with the story that dragons used to exist, but they don't exist anymore. So what if they did go into that type exactly. of storyline? So I mean, uh, that'd be upsetting. Where did they go? I mean, exactly what happened. Maybe they're extinct, mm -hmm. or they're on the brink of extinction. I think mm -hmm. that'd be an interesting and I think, story to play with. Especially because what we've seen, they mentioned in this film, one of the ominous um, lines was how many alphas are there? And they mentioned like five. And if we have one that's injured and one that just died, like how is that affecting the dragon population? Like they were the, what, the, they said they were the original originals of the species. Right. Mm -hmm. So r killing them might have a very big impact. Absolutely. Because, sure. you know, you killed the top one, mm -hmm. everything underneath it is bound to fall as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, and the injured one can't be an alpha anymore because he's been hobbled um to an extent but but we have hiccup mm -hmm. and if we're going under the assumption that there are what two more alphas somewhere out in this universe in this two world or two or three right. well but hiccup's one so or toothless to, i mean toothless, toothless is one toothless. but well, are maybe the be a start <laughs> of another new breed Who knows? Maybe. another new generation of alphas yeah. which would be another cool yeah. story uh and also the the director dean he said uh because it does take three to four years to create an anim full animation Absolutely. movie yeah. that they need to start now <laughs> and yeah. uh he said that there are two versions that he has in his head that um where they would pick up the third one would it immediately pick up where they left off or the second version like it might be a little farther off down right. maybe, maybe mm -hmm. another five years, mm -hmm. another half decade to right. pick it up. So it could really be anywhere. Well, uh, well, Dean the Blo the Blois does say uh, when asked, "Did you envision? Uh, did you envision this as part of a trilogy? We're trying to make the best movie we could make. I don't think any, any of us had a grand plan in mind." But when we were talked to coming up with ideas for a second one, there were threads in the first one that hadn't been completely explained. Like, what happened to Hiccup's mother, which we talked about. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Look, see how on we are? We're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're pretty on. And um, and what was that red death, the top of the chain in terms of dragon hierarchy? Or is there another dragon beyond that? There were certain things that we could play with. So it very naturally opened up for us. My only pitch back was that it be a trilogy instead of just a random next sequel so that it could really feel like it was a second act of a three-act story. Mm -hmm. So, we'll, you know, we'll see. Listen, I he's done a good job thus far. He did make a very good sequel that's worthy of the original. He expanded the universe. He did what a very good sequel should do. Expand upon the universe. Try to be and live up to the first one. Don't disrespect your audience or mm -hmm. the goodwill that your first one garnered. Mm -hmm. Be smart about it. Move your characters forward. And then, you know, we'll see what happens when the third one comes out. Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, you had two I'm movies. looking forward to it. Right. And both movies have gotten very good reviews. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to it as well. Yeah. And I just want to quickly talk about the music. I mean, we had John Powell back as the composer for this one, and I loved how he built upon his already set scores but made it more grand. He did exactly what right. they did with the scope of the film to yeah. the music, which is why it reflected really well. You still get 
you can recall the same music. You can feel, you hear the same tunes. You right. pick up off the same instruments. Um, to me, there's a lot more vocal work in this one. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that they did use like a hundred person choir and like a hundred twenty person orchestra. So they did have a lot of people going into this recording session. Um, but so to me, that was interesting. I do like that they use kind of folk instruments throughout the score. It, I think it really embraces that culture and adds um, like an element of fantasy and whimsy and with the <laughs> flutes and everything, you do get that playfulness that surrounds right. this film. And and also using the same instruments, but in different ways, because <laughs> especially the bagpipes for mm-hmm. one, um, John Powell mentioned that in the first film, he used bagpipes for a celebratory type of situations and stuff. Sure. And it was more happy. And then he said in this, the second one, that he used it in a more medieval way, more threatening, that he used it as like warning s- signals. Sure. When we mm-hmm. saw the big alpha, like people were blowing, blowing the horn. So it was more a darker use of bagpipes. And he had to, he also had to parallel the themes of this movie. Um, you know, he goes on to say, because, you know, this is a, uh, our characters are more mature this time when we're mm-hmm. seeing them again for the second time. 20 years old. Mm-hmm. That's a lot different than, than you, what, 20 is a lot different from being 15 or 16. And mm-hmm. he had to make his music mature as well uh, with the character so that it parallels, plays better. Um, you know, and at the same time, he couldn't make it so grand. Uh, you know, he says, he goes, look, this is a mature film. He goes, however, it can't be Lord of the Rings. I can't be that that you know that grand and um, mm-hmm. but yeah he did he you know he he wanted to uh, match the times and like you said the bagpipes and his big orchestra and it sounds again the world that they create again this is a very collaborative effort in the effort and the music only adds to that world mm-hmm. it, it brings a, a new palette of color so to speak mm-hmm. uh, when you when you watch this movie the music mm-hmm. score I thought was very very good. Yeah, so what do what are we hoping for for season uh, season I'm <laughs> talk too much television. Um for the there third are kind film. of seasons of this. In like, a you way, can find yeah. like those. And season they three, I guess up, you can say. No, but they made other episodes outside of just these they, films. They so. did. They made that T V series on I believe it's Cartoon Network. And so even Jay Baruchel and America Ferrera, they never really left these characters. No. They were They've always been, no. it's been part of them for the last mm-hmm. four or five years now. Mm-hmm. Which I think is great to you can still have the understanding of how in that sense you know how your character has grown over the years right. and we don't and they can bring that to right. um, the acting side sure of it. Um, I want to see in the third one like a little bit more about the dragons and their tricks like how Vaka knew that there was a backspine with and, and knew how to tell the age of Toothless just those little things that I want to learn more about the dragons and their personalities and what makes them Amazing. <laughs> you want to expand the dragon world even more. I do. I, I do. can totally see that. Because we I know that... there are different levels, but now what are, like, how different mm-hmm. apart mm-hmm. are they? Right. Exactly. I, I agree. I I'm, I think it's fascinating, um, especially because they have, I mean, it's been talked about a lot around this movie that, you know, dragons are, like, the thing right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, but one thing how Dream Your Dragon does have differently is that it is not just one particular like species that varies just by like color like i'm a huge game of thrones fan I, we've watched all these ones and typically the dragons look very similar have, they all like spurt fire or whatnot and they are just like oh that one's red that one's green that one's black they're different sizes but this series franchise really embraces that no they're like fish like there are so many yeah, different there, types yeah, there's individuality so upon mm-hmm. them there's personality sure. to them absolutely so i think that it's, it's great fun to point out that difference and show everything right. that they yeah. can do examples of personality um the production designer pierre olivier <laughs> vincent he mentioned that you know what would you do if you put a bulldog and a dragon together you would get a grand cole so just right. those little things i want to expand more details mm. I, i'm dragons. just looking much like this sequel you know the, the third movie character uh i just well no just, just Again, take me to the next step. Like, blow up the world a little bit more for I'm me. S- Not just the dragons, but uh, this Viking world. More uh, fun inventions. I want to see from Hiccup. Yeah, I just well, I want to see where Hiccup, you know, where he lands or doesn't land. And 
I just want an expansion of the entire world. It doesn't, you know... Not just it, Burke as much. Maybe. Not just yeah. Burke, but I, I just want to see an expansion of, you know, we'll, perhaps we will learn. I mean, you guys came up with some great theories regarding re- regarding Toothless, and maybe there is a, a, a female... Um, Midnight or uh, Night, Fury. Night Fury dragon out there. Who knows? But also within the maybe there are other Viking tribes out there as well. I don't know, but it's just expanding the universe. Um, much like you did in this one, you you opened up my eyes a little bit more from the first one. You expanded upon that, and I came away going, "Hey, that was great." I learned a little bit more about mm-hmm. this, mm-hmm. and I want to see character expansion as well. I want to yeah. see, you know, perhaps we'll see how is Hiccup. Uh, 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 dealing with his responsibility and is it hindering him from being you know the explorer the adventurer that he loves to be or Mm -hmm. maybe he maybe he starts to become more like his dad and then he's like gotta break out into the world because that's you gotta find a balance and when you're in your mid-20s going into 30s that's what that's about it's about trying to find that balance can i be the person that i was while having these new responsibilities so, you know. Yeah, I want to see how Hiccup, you know, uses his innovations and inventions to better his community of Burke and how to help with um, the dragons, too. Mm-hmm. And also, just a, another little fun fact the Dean himself, that he, when growing up, he liked tinkering with objects and, you know, playing with that. And so, kind of added that to yeah. Hiccup's character, always improving on something and having those <coughs> fun, creative inventions. Sure. So, I think that's it for. Uh, this film, if well, there's no, I, well, actually, there, well, there's a couple of things. There's one thing I think we have to talk about because it has been in the press. But okay. I also want to go back to the composer because I think like he had a great story about, you know, uh, usually you know you're composing a, a movie and whatnot, and you can get dailies to look at, but actual, you can get actual f- type of footage or mm-hmm. whatnot, or in some cases, a job, your movie's pretty much edited and done and ready to go, and you can. This movie, it's an animated. He can only go off storyboards, and he's like going, "I, you know, storyboards can change." I just find it that's a fascinating challenge for a composer, uh, you know, it, it, to score a movie. And he, I think he was said um, when seeing either this movie or the first movie at Cannes, he's like, "God, I wish I had seen all this <laughs> when when I was able to sit down. It would have been so much easier to do." So I always found that funny. The one thing that we that that, that I think you talk about too because it has been brought up is gobber uh in some in some articles uh, uh, it has been brought up that this is the first movie in which an animated ca- character has quote unquote come out of the closet and um and this is all all because of uh, uh craig ferguson's line in the movie when 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 um uh, when husband and wife are arguing mm-hmm. and this is and then Gobber's character says this is why I didn't get married well that and another that and another reason mm-hmm. and it's a, it's just a throwaway line and somehow easily overlooked yeah it was easily overlooked but it but wasn't fr- easily overlooked because well, it was very like well here's what happened and, and this is where I, I find that the story gets very interesting this is why I never get that line and one more reason was an ad lib line mm-hmm. from from Ferguson. His line was the see this is why I never get married. Somehow this got blown up because when he was in his voicing section, mm-hmm. he says, "Oh, and one more reason." After that, he said, "Yep, that's right." And he didn't say this as working and he didn't say this as an overvoice. He just said it they said cut, okay, it's a, it's a it's a take. And he goes, "Up, oh, that's right. Gobber's coming out." And for some reason, people really jumped on this to say, oh, we have a gay character. And like, oh, and then it's been written like in various things about what happened to that scene where he comes out of the closet. And and, and the director, Dean, who is openly gay, came out. Yep. And, I never had a scene where anybody came out of the closet. It's sort of kind of funny how this has morphed into that only because, I mean, like when I heard the line, I didn't, didn't see too it. much of it. No, I mean that and one other reason you know who knows what that other reason is but it's just funny how this gets out and this gets out is like this is the first animated cartoon character that's coming out of a closet and it's like wow are we like are we start for something like this i mean it was just a throw it was an ad lib line Mm -hmm. it wasn't even printed in the script and he just had to happen to say something matter of you know as he's a comedian he's a that's it 
Gobber's coming out of the closet, you know? And somehow that just got blown up into this thing. And did you see it as anything else other than you did? Yeah, completely. I mean, because... But how do you know what... And one more reason. I mean, I wasn't positive, but I felt like it... It was that's what it was hinting, implying. I mean, I mean, I, I, mean, I didn't look at it that way until I found it after. I mean, I didn't really think anything of it. Yeah, I mean, it was literally in the caught of the moment. We're we're focusing on another relationship instead See, of his. Like that's right. why it did stick out to me because if we were like we were so focused on one thing and then he had one line and there was like a poignant pause and then there was a second line and I was like did pull me out of their relationship and focus on him, which made me think, oh, what does that mean? Uh, he could and fart a lot and he can't mm. find a wife or maybe that he's not. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I guess to it me, was it, was, just, it, was it was just, just exactly, a weird it was thing just what I, that a lot of people just gravitated to towards mind. that. Interesting. I, th- I mean, I didn't think it, I that think or I watched my... too much Game of Thrones and he was a eunuch, but I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, he is, you know, missing a lot of parts. Uh, that, that, well, you I know. Mean, it, but it's Disney, so I figured it wasn't that. In my audience <laughs> that I was watching it with, everyone laughed at the line, um, this is why I never got married. And I think I might have just probably missed the second line because that reading that mm-hmm. became a surprise to me. I was like, I didn't even see it or recognize right. it in, yeah. when I was watching it. So I now, think it's just one of those situations where they're trying to blow it up. Man, it's really nothing. It, when there's nothing there. Now, nothing. Now, but Dean but goes on to say... But there's nothing wrong with that either. So. I'm not saying... Not that there's yeah. anything wrong with that. It's just... It's an interesting thing to harp on when A was an ad-lib line. So it wasn't meant originally to be that serious. to begin with. He, but they kept it, it in. Yeah, but yeah. many ad-libs, you know, mm-hmm. get kept in. Now, now Dean says, oh, that's it. Maybe he should. And so it was Dean's decision, not mine. I just threw in an ad lib line in. But Jerry, when he saw the film, thought it it wasn't that I was gay, that the reason I hadn't gotten married because I'd lost my junk. It got cut off in a dragon <laughs> fight, which tells you more about his mind than it does about anything else going on. <laughs> I guess I'm similar. <laughs> there you go. Because these are my <laughs> options that I was thinking. So it's just, it, it, it's just interesting to find controversy okay, sure. where... Where there, no there is need, none. Where there is none. Yeah. You know? So. I, I agree. But overall, that doesn't really change anything in the film. No. I loved it. It doesn't it change anything. Fun. I'm going to have my own kids watch this movie and love it. And when, you know, they yeah. grow up. I mean, it's a great franchise to definitely get a part of. Especially exactly. coming off a of Toy Story. Going into How to Train Your Dragon. It's something that anyone can look forward to. Yeah. And I really think it, 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 in some ways it lives up to certain Pixar standards of storytelling. All and right. it, it, it hits them. I think it's a, yeah. I thought it was very well, very well conceived and brought to life. Yep. Come and forward. all right. So where can everyone follow you to keep talking about films and everything, Dimitri? Right here. Um, right here. You know, uh, put in your comments, please. Uh, yes, I write back. It. I pay attention. I really do. Um, and thank you to the gentleman, uh, to Maleficent. You would uh, somebody recommended another L. Fanning movie. I'm going to mm-hmm. try to watch that this weekend, but I'm right here. Yeah. So. And Sarah, we can find I'm you. here as well, or you can find me on our st- AfterBuzz TV. Yeah, you can follow myself on AfterBuzz TV as well. You can follow all of us here on Anatomy of a Movie on Twitter at Movie Anatomy. On our website, check out our awesome schedule, AnatomyofaMovie.com. We have fun summer blockbusters still down the pipeline to talk about. Thank you all for listening. I hope you sure enjoyed this one, and we will see you for our next dissection. Good being back with you, folks. Yes. A lot of fun. We're like Team Hiccup, red and black. Team Hiccup. Yeah. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the rest of the Anatomy of a Movie staff, we would like to thank you for listening and subscribing to the show. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email or tweet us. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been Anatomy of a Movie. Thanks for watching Anatomy of a Movie on YouTube. For more on your favorite movies, subscribe to our channel here and be sure to let us know what you think in our comment section below here. Bye. Today. Yeah. No, I, you know, the first, the, the, the first How to Train Your Dragon for me was, was, was a very nice, pleasant surprise. I didn't, uh, you know, I had heard, I mean, it was getting good reviews. Uh, it was getting very good will. And, uh, you know, when I saw it, I was like, I was impressed and it looked great. Uh, you know, it wasn't my first 3D movie. Uh, <laughs> my first 3D movie in theaters is something called Coming At Ya. Yeah, look it up. But in any case, <laughs> um, 
you know, it, it looked great, but, you know, and part of the reason, too, is, you know, we'll talk about them a little bit later, but they had, you know, they brought aboard um, Roger Deakins as a cinematographer. This guy's worked with the Coen brothers and such. I mean, he's a great cinematographer, and they brought him on to consult because they were filming in 3D. And so that's, you know, the movie just looked uh, amazing, and it did really well. Uh, unfortunately, for How to Train Your Dragon, it was co- it, that that first one was coming out at a time too when 3D was sort of kind of getting a bashing. Where mm-hmm. not every movie was, you know, really good at 3D. But I think How to Train Your Dragon was very good in 3D. And I will say, I did see How to Train Your Dragon two in 3D, and again beautiful like i would recommend the the upcharge ticket price because i thought it looked fantastic amazing yeah i mean i i love this movie so much i want to go back and see Mm. it in 3d um but i want to talk a little bit of just the beginning of remaking the second one because when they made the first one it was about a month after its release that they were already in talks to make a second one and then they jumped at that opportunity and the director dean de blois de blois yeah. i'm gonna butcher his name we'll call him dean for the sake of <laughs> thanks <laughs> dean dean the director he mentioned that if he was going to do a sequel it should be this could potentially be nominated for best animated feature because well Absolutely. we don't have a disney movie this year we don't have a pixar movie this year so this one right now for me is standing out i, I think it's uh you know i think it's i think it's a solid film i Very i agree solid. i mean i was a huge fan of the first one when it came out in 2010 how to turn your dragon one was actually my first 3d film that i saw in theaters oh. so i i really enjoyed the experience it was more enhanced the first time i saw the first movie so i loved it from the beginning and then you know you mentioned toy story and that franchise i actually because toy story 3 and how to turn your dragon came out in the same year different times of the year but it was like the same time and i actually thought how to turn your dragon was Better than Toy Story 3. I mean, hate me. Blasphemy, I do. I know. But I personally, that, <laughs> I that, don't really. that was my personal opinion. I yeah. thought, you know, Toy Story 3 at that point was a bit overhyped and a bit overrated. And Toy Story, they're great films. I love them too. But I thought How to Train Your Dragon was so original and it was new. It was a new animated franchise that kids can latch on to and also the adults too because we love pets and then having dragons you know, portray anything of a mm-hmm. cat, dog-like characteristics, we're going to, you know, uh, admire that. And that that's always fun to watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if I have to pick a side between Toy Story and How to Train Your Dragon, I'm going to pick How to Train Your Dragon. Yeah, you're both, you're both out of your minds. Me too. I mean, <laughs> for, for a screenplay, even for a screenplay. But it but but doesn't Toy mean I love you less. <laughs> Toy Story is a great franchise. No, I'm not saying I disliked mm-hmm, yeah. it, but I really did enjoy How to Train Your Dragon. For yeah, especially exactly. being original, and Toy Story has already been out for 10 years, mm-hmm. and then having something new and fresh to animation, I really appealed. Seeing conversational scenes start happening, I did find myself overanalyzing. So I had to kind of like be like, remember to just kind of imagine and let it be free and stop thinking so much um but overall i was very happy it was very hard to let go of all the expectations i had built up though okay interesting um yeah no this movie pleasantly surprised me it's uh for me personally it's very tough to make an animated sequel and make it work um in my the you know my humble opinion for whatever i know uh, for whatever it's worth, you know, there's only been a few. Like, you know, to me, the Toy Story trilogy is, if you're going to talk about animated, that's the best animated trilogy you're going to find. I mean, near perfect screenplays on each one, story wise, hard to compare to that. And there's been a couple of other animated sequels that have been okay, but for the most part, you know, you can get burned because it's a money grab. And, you know, I'll go back to Pixar Cars 2. To mm-hmm. me, was a very big disappointment. I'm such a huge fan of Cars. So going into this one, mm-hmm. I didn't <clears throat> quite, you know, I, I went in with with not a, a, a huge expectation. I, I, I most certainly enjoyed the first movie. I thought they created a fantastic world, and it was fun, and it had a good story to it. And ultimately, that's what it comes down to. You need a good story. Uh, and then as I was watching this movie, I, I found myself, like, pleasantly surprised, and I was grinning, and I was like, you know... In the end, I, I can nitpick certain things, but um, there are certain plot points that, yeah, I get it. You, This is going to move the story this way. But I found that the story, its message, uh, I really 
like, you know, I ended up enjoying it. And I said, you know, they, they came up with a good story and looking for what we have coming up to the, you know, for the rest of the year. like the- In a trilogy like sure. setting mm-hmm. that the first one, the three parts of his story. Sure. And he and just to justify doing a sequel, because a lot of people know sequels may not always live up to the first one. And so he, he says if he wants to do it, it has to be part two of you know, part threes. Right. So, and I, I liked how I liked how he approached that, and how everyone was still back on mm-hmm. board for the second one. I agree, and I think it's very gutsy. Um, it's a gutsy proposition to say, mm-hmm. um, you know, especially in today's. You know, they had a they did have a phenomenal success with How to Train Your Dragon, the first one, globally. Yeah, it did around five hundred million worldwide. That's, you know, that's a lot of spondulix right there. So you can mm-hmm. make a sequel, but still, to make a sequel to an animated feature, it's still a risky proposition. And to, mm-hmm. and for a director to say, I'll only be involved if we make this a trilogy. Because if, if we make two right, more, films. Yeah, we got to make two more. And, you know, for a studio to say, you know, and again, I, you, we can look back. It, it's sort of kind of fascinating because the first How to Train Your Dragon, if I'm correct, was released via Paramount Pictures. Uh, that's who DreamWorks had their distribution deal with um, and now a lot's changed uh, their distribution deal now is with 20th Century Fox uh, things have changed since then but for Fox to say or Katzenberg who oversees and yeah. goes okay you know what I have enough faith in you that you okay you're good to go with two more movies and we'll see where that gets us but uh, yes I green light you know I green light a trilogy that's gutsy that's very gutsy especially for so long ago already because you don't Absolutely. know how well the the first one's going to track yet and sure. how well the second one might even mm-hmm. track let alone a third right. i'm opening we have an eye sort of a nostril two teeth hmm. one of the teeth has a small cavity close call folks but i think we got here just in time Presented by Maria Menounos and Kevin Undergaro. This is Anatomy of a Movie. In-depth discussions and breakdowns of various movie titles. And now that you've seen the movie, let the dissection begin. Welcome, everybody, to Anatomy of a Movie. Today we are talking about DreamWorks animated film, How to Train Your Dragon 2. Yeah! Yes, I'm your host, Marissa Serafini, and with me I have... Hi guys, it's Sarah Stratton. Hey movie fans, Dimitri Panos. Dimitri, B. Dimitri's back. back. <laughs> He's back. Hello everyone, thank you for listening. Okay, what did we think of the sequel? Did it live up to your expectations, or did it not? Ooh, I think that I, overall, I want to say that I really enjoyed this movie. Um, I love this, I guess, franchise, mm-hmm. the first... Um, How to Train Your Dragon was one of my favorite animated movies of all time. I absolutely love it. I own it. I watch it probably more times than I should every year. Like, yeah. <laughs> but so I had really, really high expectations. Um, and I fi- found myself being a little bit hypercritical um, during the first couple of scenes. Like I was smiling crazy when they did that big dramatic flight scene in the beginning and they had the dragon in the clouds and like I I had this huge grin on my face, but then as soon as kind of the more um, talking 